I'm Jennifer Gilmore and I'm an author and advocate for women in abusive relationships. I want to get to the answers to the questions that many have from those that work in the domestic abuse sector, getting an inside feel of what it's really like in their job role and sharing it with all of you. Hi everyone, welcome to the next episode of the Hashtag Abuse Talk episode. Some of you may be watching on YouTube and some of you may be listening. And today I've got the lovely Alison Baird with me, who I met, oh it must have been, I think it is almost two years ago now, at the Coercive Control Conference in uh, Liverpool. Um, And I, um, you were speaking about stalking. I certainly had some light bulb moments and we got chatting, didn't we, really? Um, we did, yes. And yeah, I, I invited you back then <laughs> to come along onto the podcast yeah. and um, we've finally done it. So I'm really yes. excited. <laughs> Me too, absolutely. It was a bit of a whirlwind the year after when we met um, in terms of new job and um, and then this year I've had breast cancer, so um, I've just been recovering from that, working still, but trying to recover from that. So um, this morning was the first day I was able to put on some mascara um, onto my stubby little eyelashes. So, um, but it's, it's really great to finally be able to do this. Yeah, no, well, thank you for joining us. And, um, it, you know, I feel a bit like it's a part of your journey as well. So it's quite nice, really. Um, yeah. Well, obviously, when I um, met you, you were talking about stalking. So do you do you want to um, introduce yourself and tell everybody a bit about you and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So um, currently, I'm the best practice uh, lead and trainer at uh, Changing Pathways. Um, we are an Essex based charity. Uh, we partner with two other charities in Essex. Um, we provide support Um, via IDVA support, domestic abuse practitioner support, refuge, counselling to domestic abuse and stalking survivors. So we also have stalking caseworkers um, and we also work with mums um, as well around uh, sort of healthy relationships and improving um, outcomes for their children. Mm. And I think um, you reached out to me after you listened to the um, or heard about the last episode that I did with um, John Trott on yeah. um, stalking, which um, was very insightful. And I believe um, he actually referenced um, a piece of work that you were involved in, which is the Living in Fear um, what was that? They um, sort of right, a, so... an inspection, was it? Yeah, so the HMIC did an inspection into um, I think it was six police forces and the CPS to look at how after the legislation came in in November 2012 to make stalking a crime Mm. to see how effective that had been and see how police were handling cases stalking cases Um, so I sat as a panel member alongside other people and was also a critical reader on that piece of work Um, and what it showed Um, unfortunately was that actually we hadn't really come very far and that stalking still wasn't being seen as stalking it still wasn't being um, understood it was being miscrimed as harassment um, as malicious comms as uh, revenge porn um, and sometimes just not even being crimed at all Um, we've moved forward a little bit I'd say in Essex but um I'd say nationally and also in Essex there's still so much room for improvement. Um, I still deal with some cases, um, direct stalking cases um, and I I know that there needs to be improvement um, Mm. and that we need to separate stalking from harassment and really understand it and actually work together, police need to work together with CPS although they say that it normally charging decisions are made by CPS, I find it a bit of a get-out clause because actually the protocol 
shows that they should work together with CPS to build the case mm. for stalking. And also Isaacs, which um, I'm one of the first Isaacs in the country um, who is accredited um, alongside uh, some others that I keep in contact with and who are doing sterling work across the country as well. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's an amazing link up really to to follow that and um, an honour really to have you on here, you know, talking about things. So anyway, you came to me and said you'd like to talk about why doesn't she leave, which I think is a really important thing to talk about, especially at this time. So what made you decide on um, this theme to cover then? I think it's because... As a charity, and I'm sure that this will be echoed across other charities, there's this misconception that it's all around the victim. Why doesn't she leave? Um, social care might say, well, she needs to leave him. But actually, if she leaves him, then Kafkas will say in the family cause, actually, he now has a right to unsupervised contact, so the domestic abuse continues. But what I'd like to do is turn it on its head and say, why does he do that? Why are we not looking at the perpetrator? Why is the emphasis on the victim to make changes to her life that are huge, radical, costly? Um, and and actually, we're looking at the wrong um, we're looking at the wrong person. So it's the mm. wrong lens. So I think we should be saying, why does he do that? And then looking at the barriers to leaving as well. Hmm. So, I mean, obviously I can think already of, of the reasons why I didn't leave and the barriers that I faced. No, I don't think at any point anybody sort of looked at that kind of side of things. You know, why did he actually, you know, do this, yeah. um, you know, this behaviour um, and a clear pattern that was emerging. So why do you think... Um, you know, these uh, characters, this behaviour trait, this this actually happens to people then? So in terms of the perpetrator, it is all to do with their um, beliefs and values. And um, that can be from their socialisation. Um, it could be from their role model. But this is where it starts. It starts with belief and values. And we have to tackle those beliefs and values. So those misogynistic, patriarchal views and values. And if we don't, we just continue along the domestic abuse pattern mm. and allowing domestic abuse to be okay and to be part of um, part of a natural a national culture, which you know absolutely shouldn't be. Mm. So um, Lindy Bancroft actually she produced a book. Um, why does he do that? Right. It's such an excellent book. Um, and I'm just going to read a little bit about what she says. Um, she says, abusiveness has little to do with psychological problems. Um, often it is blamed on psychological problems. And everything to do with values and beliefs. Where do a boy's values about partner relationships come from? The sources are many. The most important ones include the family he grows up in, his neighbourhood, the television he watches, and books he reads, jokes he hears, messages that he receives from the toys he's given, and his most influential adult role models. So, and each boy's socialisation is unique, but, um, you know, this, this is where we need to be doing the work to turn perpetrators around and to stop people becoming perpetrators in the first place. Yes, yeah, so I guess um, maybe your angle is thinking on prevention, would you say? Can absolutely. we? Can it be prevented? Um, yeah, absolutely. And... We, can, we can do a lot of work in schools. Mm. Um, you know, this is where the people are young. If we don't catch people when they're young, then... The, the core beliefs are then built in. So we need to catch people while they're young. Yeah, and I guess um, that's kind of quite a difficult um, task, would you say? Because um, would you blanket educate a group of, you know, say if we're looking at schools like a classroom, 
um, or are we looking for key behavioural points that we need to sort of maybe look at and target? Um, and then is it the educational system that needs help with that? I think all of those are really uh, valid questions and, and suggestions. And I, I, I think that certainly um, in my children's school, there are people um, that my children will come home and say that they are, uh, they've got ADHD, they um, have been expelled from the last school, um, they have anger issues. Um, and for me, as a professional, I would want to dig deeper into that and think, what is going on for them at home? What work can be done for them around healthy relationships? What do healthy relationships look like? Mm. And again, for women and girls, what do healthy relationships look like? But this is, you know, this is everybody's business. And it's down to, you know, even the dad just saying, well, you know, um, a wife is for cooking and cleaning um, or handing the boy um, guns to play with and handing the girl a doll to play with. So it, it's these core values and beliefs we need to question and change. Mm. And um, would you say then, say we can't capture um, obviously a certain amount of um, children or as they develop and have that messaging, um, can somebody who's been um, maybe had the subliminal messages and direct messages, um, can we change that behaviour as an adult when it's already been adopted into their nature? I think there is always hope that we can change people. People have to want to change. So you have to recognise actually this behaviour is unhealthy in order to want to change. So I know that there is the change uh, project um, which is running in Essex and other counties. Um, and there is the Good Man Project, um, which helps in schools. So there are projects that are helping people. Um, but I do think we need to get there sooner rather than later, because fully formed adults find it harder to change and admit that they need to change. Mm, yes. And um, I guess I know we're talking about... Um, you know, looking at that behaviour and that change as uh, they develop into an adult. Um, and I know we've said, you know, why doesn't she leave? So can we take a moment to have a look mm. at why, yeah. why doesn't she leave then and what barriers does somebody face? Yeah, so I would say that um, one of the biggest reasons people don't leave is fear. Um, if you are in a relationship that is controlling, coercively controlling, and um, perhaps there might be threats to hurt you, harm you, um, hurt your children, hurt someone around you, the fear of leaving because of those threats is massive. Um, so I would say that that is a, a big barrier, but also as is separation. So we see um, question six on the DASH risk assessment, separation. Right. Um, this is where most women are killed at the point of separation. So if they've been in coercively controlling relationships and then they separate and there's been domestic violence as a precursor and then you get stalking, quite often these are your precursors to homicide. So another reason why people don't leave is that, you know, in the first month or the first two months and the first year, statistics and the femicide census show this is when you're more likely to be killed as a woman. I think um, um, John was sharing some um, really harsh and um, statistics from that, in um, especially linked to the living in fear. Um, and it was very, I didn't realise how vast it was really. You know, when you hear of stories, you think, oh, that's just a, a one-off occurrence. You don't realise how common it could be. Yeah. Um, I think for me, there were more reasons to, st to stay in the relationship than to leave because of that fear. Should we just take a moment maybe to like just bunch together a list of reasons on why she doesn't leave? Or yeah, happily so join in. <laughs> a really quick uh, summary. I can't touch on everything because there's so many reasons, but it could be that there's a language barrier. 
So have we considered the women who are here on spousal visas and have no recourse to public funds, uh, wouldn't even know how to get out and are pleased by their community? Um, also housing, the fear of what's going to happen, where do I go, um, what's going to happen in terms of my housing, trauma bonding, people do bond with their um, perpetrator and this is uh, another reason why people stay. Um, sometimes it's easier to stay because when they've left before they were stalked and actually it's easier to see what the perpetrator is doing and know what's com what comes next than be in a position where you're going to get sorted and you don't know what's coming next. Um, so other things I've written down is mistrust in agencies. Um, yeah. So it could be that they've had previous dealings with um, an agency such as children's social care or police or the criminal justice system and they don't trust in the system. So there is that general feel of mistrust sometimes. Um, worry that their children might be taken away. Um, that's a, a huge reason. And actually perpetrators will say, you know, you'll have your children taken away and they'll use that against the victim. Um, and the failure to protect argument comes in from children's social care. But I would say actually it's a failure to protect when family courts then give that perpetrator uh, contact with a domestic abuser or stalker. Um, so, and again, we touched on not knowing it's abuse but also not knowing your rights. And actually article two and article three of the human rights um, are the right to life and the right not to live in degrading um, circumstances um, or torture, so with article three. So, you know, they're important to look at in terms of when we advocate as well and for people to know about um, the stigma of it. So it could be that someone has a, a a stigma attached to it. I came across a woman the other day who um, her job was in domestic abuse and um, she felt unable to come out and say anything because she felt she should know better. But actually, no, everyone could be a victim. Um, she also made a really good point that someone had put all of their, um, so you might have a poster like this um, up in your office. Someone had put it in the corridors actually these kind of posters need to go into toilets and somewhere discreet. So these are sort of just a few reasons why people um, may not leave. Yeah, I mean, I think, like you say, there could be, you know, thousands of reasons, to be honest. And I think that's something that it's not considered when comments come, like, I would have just given him a slap and left. It's, it's, it's just, yeah. it's, it's more than that you know I wouldn't have put up with it why did they put up with it it's it's not it's um I mean if we if we knew what was going to happen we wouldn't enter that relationship would we it's Absolutely. it's a progressive um form of abuse so yeah. in the beginning it wasn't like that in the beginning mm -hmm. it's what we thought I always feel like we were missold like <laughs> We would, if this was a, an advert for something, we'd complain because it's mis-selling. Um, yeah. And I feel like that's kind of what it's like. Um, I think that's a really know. good analogy. And actually, they don't come with stickers on their head saying, <laughs> I am an abusive perpetrator, because they don't behave like that all the time. And they'll start by charming you. Mm. So you're you're right. You, you are mis-sold. Mm. Um, but equally, the police have a, a duty of care really to share information under Claire's law yeah. because a lot of these guys are serial perpetrators so really there should also be some uh, I would say raising of awareness around Claire's law and mm. the disclosure um, to to potential victims. Mm. No thank you for that um, a, a good you know strong list really of reasons there. And obviously, we've got the added barrier at the moment of um, a pandemic in COVID. So what would you suggest to, um, you know, maybe somebody who's in that type of relationship, um, you know, do it in the situation that we're in at the moment then? Yeah. I mean, it's especially hard now, isn't it? Because we're not just looking at a, a myriad of 
usual barriers that we have. We're looking at um, really substantive barriers, uh, i.e. COVID, people working from home, people um, unable to reach for safety, people unable to um, reach out. So I think, you know, there are ways to reach out through your GP, um, through um, if, if that perpetrator perhaps is going on a run, um, there are windows of opportunity. So knowing their habits, um, but also knowing who to reach out to, mm. because that can be a big barrier. If you don't know who to phone or who to reach out to, then where do you start? So you need to start by looking up who is your um, domestic abuse service in your county, who can help you. Um, there, there is refuge nationally, there is women's aid nationally, uh, changing pathways in Essex, next chapter in Essex, safe steps in Essex. Um, I could go on, but you know, we have to find really dif different uh, ways of helping people leave safely. Because again, it's not just about going, oh, right, I'm gonna separate and I'm leaving now, because that's the red rag to a bull and that's when women get harmed. So it has to be carefully planned. An exit strategy has to be carefully planned. If a woman is working, that could be an opportunity to mm -hmm. involve their employer in helping them leave because they could be put into perhaps an office that isn't being used, that is safe, a safe space for them to work. And in fact, I was doing this with a victim yesterday. Mm. I think it's, um, I mean, it's, it's always quite a, um, it's difficult isn't it and I think one of the things that I um, hadn't really considered or thought about is that there are probably many women out there and men as well um, that don't actually know that what they're going through is abusive and I think that from from my point of view we need to help um, raise awareness in different ways without the terminology blocking um certain things as well and that messaging um especially because even just yesterday i was speaking to somebody who was in i've not had you know there's nothing physical there's no threats but this is what's happening you know it's more emotional and i can't explain it it's very subtle and um, it makes me feel this way so how are we going to get the message to people that don't even know they're in an abusive relationship that they're you know in this situation and they don't have to be living in there so i think that's a really good point and I, um public the general public must um understand about domestic abuse to be able to help um their friends or family members reach out because if you don't understand about it you can actually make mistakes and make it more dangerous for someone to leave um so i would say raising public awareness is important and i would signpost to somewhere like uh, for instance the alice ruggles trust so they have done so much work since um alice's tragic murder on um on and around stalking, but actually the story they tell in their um, YouTube clip um, is one of domestic abuse initially and coercive control and seeing the signs of her losing weight, her losing friends, her losing confidence, him telling her that she hasn't got enough money to go out, um, him telling her how to dress, um, and then, so them noticing these changes, but being unable to see that actually uh, that was the domestic abuse bit. And when she separated, the stalking started and actually that was even more dangerous and he ended up murdering her. Mm. Now they raised a lot of awareness around that. And actually one, if I was gonna recommend watching something, I would say go to the um, site, type in Alice Ruggles and the YouTube video because it does highlight the creep of domestic abuse, the creep of um, coercive control and the signs, what to signpost um, victims to. And I've actually shown that to a friend before whose daughter was going through this. And because Alice was so young, 
it's harder for younger people to even understand the danger they might be in. Mm. So for young people, I think that is especially, especially powerful and a, a really good, I don't want to say really good case because that was a murder, um, but a really good way of, it commemorates her death as well, but it also helps other people to recognize the signs and reach out. Hmm. Well, what I'll do is I'll pop that in the description so anybody can just click through to that link straight away and have um, a watch of it. But I have, I think I've seen that one myself and, yeah. um, you know, seen that story. I think the in the news on on the on occasion as well linked to other stories um and agree that what they do is um in campaign work as well is um just yeah. you know outstanding considering where it comes from Absolutely. um now obviously um we've touched on relationships and you know there's uh, differences as we grow up and what we're told and something that i was thinking about um just even over the last few days i've thought about it for quite a few years is um, the material we watch. So romantic films, um, teen movies, and the messaging they give out. And I think that's a really difficult thing for, we can't control what movies play out and um, what we do with those. But even for myself as, as a person, we, we can see, you know, the ideas that were put into our head as growing up and what we thought reality would be like and, you know, maybe that happy ever after kind of feeling. Um, how do we battle with things like that then? How do we help our younger generation to understand that that isn't um, reality? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's a good point. Um, and I also recognise growing up that i um, a lot of the um, fairy stories I was told are based on Prince Charming. And Prince Charming, and when someone says the word he's charming, rings alarm bells for domestic abuse workers because it makes you think, okay, he's probably a perpetrator. Charming is not a good, a good sign. Um, so I think we need to start by tackling it at the beginning you know, it shouldn't be fairy tales where Prince Charming comes and rescues the princess. Um, the women, the girls, should be the heroines. Um, so we need to start empowering girls and change the thinking. Um, and actually starting there, and again, we can challenge the film industry mm. around these rom-coms, but we are seeing stronger role models um, coming out from... Um, so, for instance, Emma Watson, I think, who played Hermione in um, Harry Potter. Now. Harry Potter, <laughs> thank you. Um, she is um, a, a good advocate for feminism. And so, you know, if we're pointing our children in this direction, again, that's about values and beliefs and, and making those changes. Um, so books are, are, are powerful in terms of... Um, making making changes to our belief system core belief systems and so are rom-coms and the the some of the complete trite um rubbish that is peddled um needs to be changed needs it's to be like... rather more lara croft than um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah I like Lara Croft I used yeah. to like Lara Croft um yeah well I, you know I agree and I think even now when I watch back movies that I used to watch you know when I was younger and I look back now and I'm like god oh, that is you know that's a warning sign to me now um whereas I've been told that this is okay when mm. you know I was a young girl you know a teen um so it's certainly something for parents to look out for and I think um, I've got two girls, which is a worry in itself, but I've also got um, a boy and I really worry for him growing up in, you know, today's society in general, all these pressures and, um, you know, the idea, you know, even consent. And I'm really worried for him and I want to be the, the, the best I can be to educate him in the right way so that he has this understanding. But it's not just necessarily now, consent or you know the difference between healthy relationships and unhealthy 
it's um, how we word things and how things might come across um, to people and offence. So it's certainly um, a society change for everything, I think. And I don't know if you've thought about this, this which are going on a different subject here, really. But because of COVID, um, our change in behaviour in human contact anyway is going to be different. When we all come out of COVID and I'm quite um, a huggy person, so I like to hug people, I'm going to have to ask permission to see if it's even okay to come near somebody because of what's happened in this pandemic. So I think maybe, even though we've had such a bad period of time, there might be some good uh, changes that could come out of it. And it's just how everybody uses the situation to sort of take it forward I guess I don't know what your thoughts are on that it's completely different Um, well I guess um you know Covid is again it's really isolating isn't it um but I would say that just in terms of safeguarding um if when we're dealing with uh, survivors I would rather put Covid to one side and say um your safety is more important than COVID. So if you need to breach COVID regulations to escape, to work in a safe place, your safeguarding comes first Mm. and it trumps COVID. So, and I would say that to workplaces, to think about their workers, this safeguarding issue trumps COVID. Yeah, no, it's an important message, I think. The, a lot of people that have um, come out just before the second lockdown and some that still haven't yet made it um, and you know worried about things like refuges being full or uh, not being able to access the right support or help um, but obviously that's not the case it's letting people know that it's um, available yeah. and there are still yeah. services out there that are willing to help. Absolutely and I, I would say that you know we have space in a couple of our refuges. We try and move people on. Um, there are budgets and grants that have been given due to COVID to cha- uh, charities mm-hmm. um, regarding housing as well. So please, you know, it, some refuges might be full, but that that's a, it could be a misconception that you won't be able to get help from a refuge. We are certainly still working with victims, survivors, and bringing them into refuge with their children on a daily basis. Mm. No, thank you for that. Well, obviously um, you're at Changing Pathways, so, and that's a charity, isn't it? Sorry, I got thirsty. (laughs) Um, It is, so we are a charity. We've been established for over 40 years. um, So we have a lot of experience. um, And we used to be Basildon Women's Aid, used used to come under. Yeah, and, um, if people wanted to get in touch with you then, um, obviously from what they've heard, um, how would they do that? So we have a helpline number, which is 01268 707, And that is specifically for changing pathways. Um, and across Essex, if it doesn't fit into our area, um, it's 0330 triple three seven triple four and that will get you in touch with the right support across Essex Um, and I'd say for anybody else um, I would contact Women's Aid nationally and I would contact the um, National Domestic Violence Helpline uh, nationally. No problem. And we can pop all of that information again in the description so everyone can find it if they need it. Today is the um, start of um, the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls. So although this might not go out today, this we're filming this today on yeah. that start and that start of 16 days of activism. Um, so one of the things that I... Um, I shouldn't say I'm really excited to see, but I'm really pleased to see is that Karen and Gala Smith, alongside other um, key workers, have produced their 10-year report um, published today on femicides. Um, and this is a key piece of work, and she's been doing this work counting dead women since 2012, since Kirsty Trello 
was murdered on 2nd of um, January 2012. And, you know, I, I pay homage to her and, and her counterparts that are helping and assisting with this, this really incredible work. Mm -hmm. But I would also urge people to read it. Um, follow Karen and Gala Smith on Twitter, follow her at Naya, follow Counting um, Dead Women, because this is where we can make the difference. Mm. No, thank you. Yeah, it's a, I, it was completely a coincidence that today yeah. we were recording as well. Yeah. Um, I hadn't even considered it when we put the date in the diary, but it, you know, it just shows that we we still work, you know, through these days, and it it's even more important, isn't it, to recognise uh, the the work that is happening around the country. Um, yeah. And I hear so many different um, stories, so many different campaigns, organisations, charities, individuals that are constantly doing something to to help other people and to change policies and um, systems, yeah. hopefully one day. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think it just feels like um, a bit of a battle, doesn't it? To try and get voices to be heard. But I think if we all come together and collaborate and stand together, then we'll have more likely to be heard that way, perhaps. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I just want to say thank you, Alison, for spending some time with me today and talking about, you know, why she doesn't leave and maybe turning it on its head like you have done, um, which is great. Um, and just, you know, appreciate your your time here today and the work that you do as well. As I mentioned, you um, really helped me when I heard you speak and um, gave me some light bulb moments and gave me some sort of inspiration to do something in my own personal case and um, I'm really glad that I was there that day to hear what you had to say um, so your work is important and does make a difference um, and I know that from a personal level. Thank you Jennifer I really I really appreciate that feedback um, and likewise I would say your work that you're doing is also vital um, and since we met at that that conference the amount of work you've done for domestic abuse victims um, is huge. Oh, thank you.